My name is Emily Kasdan, I'm a curatorial assistant and the coordinating curator of the exhibition Art Spiegelman's Comix, A Retrospective. We are so glad you could join us for this evening's program, Dialogue and Discourse, Art Spiegelman and Tony Kushner. And before I introduce our speakers, I should mention that our last public program of the season will take place on next Thursday at 6.30 p.m. This program is, a, is the first in a new series called Wish You Were Here, in which our deputy director, Jens Hoffman, will interview the subjects of Warhol's 10 portraits of the Jews of the 20th century. <laughs> For full details about all, all of our uh, upcoming public programs, please visit our website or sign up for our e-newsletter at the table near the door. Art Spiegelman has worn many hats, cartoonist, editor, graphic illustrator, and writer. He's been called the father of the graphic novel, although he's still demanding a paternity test. <laughs> Spurred by a tireless drive for innovation and a refusal to be self-satisfied, Spiegelman has produced a diverse body of work, from his transgressive and avant-garde comics of the underground and raw magazine, to politically charged covers for The New Yorker, to children's books, comics essays, graphics, and more. His work comixes the personal and the universal, the avant-garde and the mass-produced, memory and history. These themes coalesce most seamlessly in his modern classic, Mouse, the book-length comic about his parents' wartime experience and Spiegelman's own, tro own troubled relationship with his father, Vladek, a survivor of Auschwitz. The Pulitzer Prize he won for Mouse in 1992 is one of many of his distinguished awards. In 2005, he was made a Chevalier of the Order of Arts and Letters in France and was named one of Time Magazine's 100 Most Influential People and in 2006 was inducted into the, into the Art Director's Hall of Fame. More recently, he won the 2011 National Jewish Book Award for his memoir, Metamouse, and in 2012 was awarded the Grand Prix for Lifetime Achievement at the Angulam Comics Festival, initiating the retrospective downstairs, which I hope you've all had a chance to see. Now, Art has given a ton of interviews. I think he has been asked every question there is. And his knowledge is so encyclopedic that if we wanted to enter uncharted waters tonight, that really would have left only one topic for tonight's program about which Art claims to know nothing, baseball. <laughs> if we are going to stay, steer clear of the Yankees, we would need to find a conversationalist who equaled Art in wit, creativity, and gumption. And I think we found our man. Since Tony Kushner's career began in the early 80s, he has worn, also worn many hats. Playwright, director, and author of essays, books, and screenplays including Steven Spielberg's films Munich and Lincoln. Kushner's work is socially and politically charged, historically self-aware, and timely. He has a humanizing talent for giving voice to the marginalized, whether it's the fraught 1980s gay community and angels in America, victims of war-torn Afghanistan and homebody Kabul, or a southern black maid in the civil rights era in Caroline or Change. Someone once described Kushner as, quote, the most charming dissident around, which, oddly enough, I think is a perfect description for you too, Art. <laughs> he is the recipient of the Pulitzer Prize, two Tony Awards, three Obie Awards, two Evening Standards Awards, an Olivier Award, an Emmy Award, two Oscar nominations, just to name a few. With his probing intellect and his relentless stamina to take on even the toughest issues, Kushner asked the questions that challenge our very, very humanity, which is why I know tonight's conversation is going to be dynamic engaging, and may even make Art scratch his head. Now I ask you to please take a moment to turn off your cell phones and join me in welcoming Art Spiegelman and Tony Kushner. So, uh, baseball. <laughs> I, mean, I, mean, well, I know nothing about anything. I thought that build-up meant I should head for the door and run while I still have time, you know? But, uh, but do you know less? Uh, I think we should have, we could have a competition to see which of us knows less about baseball. <laughs> um, you actually played it because you have that in, in uh, uh, one of your uh, strips, I think. Um, is it in this catalog uh, you're, where you're trying to play yeah, with, it was with a, your... Yeah, it was about how I became a cartoonist because... I spent a lot of time in libraries and running uh, away from school so that I wouldn't get caught up in a game where I would then be 
uh, taunted, beaten, and ostracized for my ineptitude. And only years later found out it was because I only have one working eye, which meant that wherever the ball is, it's not where I think it is. Uh, um, and got hit in the face by softballs a lot. Um, but I found that it's very good for cartooning because cartooning is two-dimensional reality is reality to me in a certain way. So, uh, and you, you said in the that. script that you can't actually uh, see 3D comics. I, remember, I had completely forgotten that there were such things until I uh, was reminded <laughs> by your script. So can you watch 3D movies? Does, that work, does it work for you? Not can you see gravity? Well, no. <laughs> No, no, I might as well just see him in 2D. But when I saw the Scorsese film, uh, the one Hugo, with yeah. Hugo, it was so intense that even my vestigial other eye could see the smoke uh, in front. I couldn't see the depth perception except mm. intellectually, but since a lot of it takes place in a train station and there's these kind of uh, fog machines going uh, right in front of your eyes, I realized I could take out my cigarette and not and not get caught. Everybody would assume I was just one more 3D effect, you know? It was great. So, uh, and it worked. You got away with it. I totally got away with it. Yeah, I've been doing it ever since. I'm waiting for Bloomberg to make it illegal before he leaves office. But right now, it's great. <laughs> um, all right, so I want to, uh, um, we're going to talk for about 40 minutes, I think. And then, uh, although I have absolutely no idea how I'm going to know when that, and then we're going to invite you to ask art questions. Um, so my first question is this. Uh, the stuffed mouse in the display case downstairs, is that one of the stuffed mice on your wedding cake? Absolutely. Or? Oh, good. I was hoping so. you just dressed it up for the cake. Well, it actually appeared for the first time in public at the Jewish Museum in 1985, where I was asked if I'd uh, let some mouse pages be shown here before anybody had really known mouse outside of a small cult group, uh, a curator here named Susan Goodman really liked it, had it as part of a Jewish voices, Jewish themes, new artists uh, thing. And she's going to put them in a vitrine. And I figured, well, the vitrine looks lonely. So uh, I had some uh, taxidermist stuff, some mice for me. Um, <laughs> and evidently, it takes very talented taxidermists. They're too small to stuff. But this guy did such a good job that lo, these, uh, whatever it is, 30 years later or something, um, it's still hanging in there. And in the meantime, it's been in other exhibits, uh, crawling over the artwork to freak people out. And, and when Francoise and I got, um, whatever you call it, Your married, remarried, Hitched yet again, uh, um, we had a large um, uh, genuine wedding as opposed to the kind of shotgun wedding with immigration officials holding the shotgun back in uh, the 70s. And uh, I put them on our wedding cake. And I, I offer this as a tip to all wedding planners here. Like, it's uh, you put a stuffed mouse on a wedding cake, you'll have plenty left over. It's great. <laughs> you don't have to worry if you've got enough. But these were dressed up as a bride and a groom. They had been dressed, yeah, yeah, then they were dressed here like, I, I think this was a naked mouse in the exhibit now, right? Yes, yeah. he, he's stripped of all, mm -hmm. all top hat or <laughs> bridal veil or anything else. Those are good. All right, um, I wanted to start out since we're at the Jewish Museum. We we're going to have slides and things, and but I, they didn't ask an art historian. They asked, I'm sort of an art historian today, but um, that was a pun. Anyway. Um, uh, <laughs> A writer, so I, I hope I'll uh, we'll talk enough about the imagery. Um, but I wanted to talk, start out talking to you um, about something Jewish, uh, since we're at the Jewish Museum, and uh, to ask you about uh, the subject of Jewish memory, um, because the work that you did, obviously, with Mouse, but in uh, many ways, the work that you've done as an editor with Francoise, the um, the work of reclaiming and, and bringing back to consciousness uh, earlier comic forms and so on. Uh, it seems to me that memory is an enormously important part of, of your work. And I was wondering if you uh, felt that there was any specific kind of memory that could be called Jewish memory. And, uh, and Well, I remember all the bad things that ever happened to me. I guess that's Jewish memory. Uh, um, I don't know if it's so Jewish. I think it's comics related. You know, like, I know I exist somewhere between those two self identifications as cartoonists and Jewish. Uh, uh, Jewish being an adjective, I guess, right? It's not, it's not about being observant. Um, but. Uh, Do you feel the, like there's any sort of um, pressure to remember that comes from being. It comes Jewish? from being old, you know. Uh, uh, well, then it becomes impossible to remember. Right? <laughs> then it's like, yeah, Francoise, my wife, uh, works at the New Yorker, and I don't remember which cartoonist said this to her, but uh, 
got to one of those moments like we had when we were talking about outside where we couldn't remember the name of something <laughs> and so everything stops you know and then the name was remembered and he said you know at my age remembering something is as good as sex used to be you know, so, <laughs> Um, and, but anyway, and, and if you remember. remember something without pulling out your smartphone, <laughs> that's even better oh, yeah. than... Google is an evolutionary development for yes. people who've lost their minds, yeah. Um, uh, well, the thing about memory is I think it actually comes with the cartooning territory. Whether it's Jewish or not, I, depend, I think depends on the practitioner. Uh, but it has to do with these... The thing that really I love about comics has to do with boxes next to each other, over each other, in proximity to each other, each representing a different moment in time. So it's a kind of time turned into space with, as soon as you enter into the page, you're sort of remembering. You're kind of looking back. There's a past and a present and a future on every page. And it encourages that kind of uh, relationship to an event. It's very different than your medium, which is everything's evaporating every second, never right. to be repeated ever, exactly. ever again. Here it's always present, and uh, that's like that Faulkner quote, the past, it's not even past, you know? It's, it's right in the upper left-hand corner if you're doing a traditional page of comics. The future is the part you're not supposed to look at until you've read the other parts. When did you, I mean, you, I read, um, I've been reading a lot of Spiegel, I've always been reading Spiegelman, but uh, recently, uh, there was one interview that, where you said this great thing that the, the, the basic unit of thought in comics is the page, mm -hmm. and made a distinction between that and I think film editing, where you said you know, the, mm -hmm. the panels are not interchangeable uh, in comics as, you know, in a way, in, in film. Uh, I'm so scene. envious of the people who work in film because you can shoot footage and then you can decide how to make a whole out of that later through collaging. With comics, once you've planned your page, that's your page. And if you want to edit it, it's very hard to pry it loose, especially if you have different size panels and shapes and ideas about the page as a paragraph, which is how I think of them. Uh, but what I decided to do was shoot footage. And I tried it in the 70s and didn't succeed because I was too lazy. I couldn't shoot enough extra footage. Mm. Uh, but I figured if I drew all same size panels, I could keep rearranging things and intercut other thoughts and whatever. And the first time I tried it in the 70s, it was to do, uh, it was all of the strips I did in that period became a book called Breakdowns. And when Breakdowns was going to come out again in about 2000 and uh, Eight, I think. Um, I wanted to go back to that failed idea. It was one of the strips I didn't put into breakdowns because I hadn't succeeded. And it would be a strip that would explain the book that came after by explaining different moments of my own trajectories of thought, my uh, bad Jewish memories of childhood or whatever, you know, and inter uh, splice panels because I could kind of deal them out and add panels in without destroying the entire thing. I was just dealing with little card decks mostly of panels that I'd made. It's the one part of the show that was the hardest to demo. I have a few panels from this thing called Portrait, as, Portrait of the Artist as a Young Exclamation Point Squiggle Star Asterisk Exclamation Point. <laughs> um, and that introduction was the hardest uh, thing to demo on a wall because of the strange way that it got built. It was one way of surprising myself because otherwise by the time uh, you get to the finish line you really kind of uh, trying to make sure you've nailed the corners down of what you've been planning for quite a while on a, on a page, on a book, on a 300-page comic book. Um, and here, since I didn't know how all of this stuff would fit together, I remember getting very um, annoyed at Francoise when I was showing her its latest iteration. She said, congratulations, honey, it's finished. I'd been on it for a, a year, maybe. This was uh, supposed to be just an introduction to a book of older work and it came out to be half as long as the book was introducing. And then I got so annoyed at Francoise because I said, no, no, there's all these anecdotes I haven't done yet. And then I started on the next anecdote the next day and it took me five days to realize that I was living with my, the only and best editor I've ever could have been with, that everything else was a redundancy. It really was finished and it ended the way that particular day's configuration of panels had been. Is that, um, is that the one that ends with the uh, Shklovsky? Yeah, oh, exactly. Yeah, that's extraordinary. The, and that uh, came together like with it being sort of a surprise because I kept playing, you know, like three card Monty or something, hiding some panels, putting others out and seeing what it would all be. But it, it it's actually, now that I'm sitting so here... So you didn't intend, I mean, the... the um, is it downstairs? In the, uh, not, in the, it's only in the book. In the book. Yeah, it's the a, extraordinary. There, it ends with a, can I tell this? Or, it ends with a, a very upsetting and funny uh, and, and heartbreaking moment when a, a bully 
um, Art and his mother Anya are in a park in Queens and they're watching some kid play uh, with a paddle ball and uh, the mother says something to the kid. Uh, he's He's been well, what happens is, something from There's school. an anecdote early on that was a memory of childhood when I realized my mother could not protect me. Which was, I was playing with a uh, paddle ball in this uh, the right. courtyard between some buildings we were living up in uh, near Fort Tryon Park when I was very young. And then this kid who's a little bit older than me comes over and grabs the thing from me. I go crying to my mother. Uh, and my mother says, you want I should tell your mommy what you did? And this bully kid comes over and says, I'm not scared of you, lady. You don't even know my mother. And then spits at my mother. And then we're both sitting there rattled on the bench as the kid goes off. And I'm going, he was a bad boy, right, mommy? Uh, and the thing is, that but was when you ask moment. that question, you're, you're, you're asking the question and you're back playing with your paddle <laughs> ball again. Which is but the, the, that was an anecdote early on. And then there were a lot of other anecdotes from different points in my life. But at the very end, I was moving toward things that explained my fascination with and the way I thought about comics. And that Victor Shklovsky quote was really an important one for me, which basically talked about uh, art is about the creation of difficulty. Uh, slowing down one's perception so you see what's there along the way so you appreciate the thingness of something. So I have this quote from Shlovsky with a replay. Uh, appreciate the? The thingness. Of the things. thingness, right. Uh, you know, you appreciate what it is as opposed to what it refers to. And that's what making art does if you're a formalist. Um, so here I was taking that same anecdote I had done near the beginning of what became that particular organization of panels and taking all the color and screwing it up and putting it upside down, inside out, whatever, so that you couldn't quite see what you had just seen 15 pages before. Okay. But the text now, instead of being about me and this bully and my mom, was the quote from Viktor Shlovsky in different characters' mouths. And at the end where it says um, something like art is the creation of difficulty or whatever it was at the end, there's a last panel where the color, I think, or maybe it's the black plate, is from another anecdote in which my mother is looking really worried out a window. And the other plate was from the strip, but uh, that sequence upside down. So it's a cacophony which can, and, oh no, I remember what it was. At the end of it, there's a balloon that says patui, which was a sound effect the from the spinning. You know, and it was like all that formalism, but what really remains is the spittle. You yeah. know, so that balance between uh, trauma, meaning, and form is uh, the tug of war that uh, I live inside when I'm trying to make something. I just realized I wrote down the quote: uh, it's "The purpose of art is to impart the sensation of things, you see, uh, of things as they are perceived and not as they are known." The technique of art is to make objects unfamiliar, to make forms difficult, to increase the difficulty and lengths of length of perception, because the process of perception is an aesthetic end in itself and must be prolonged. Art is a way of experiencing the artfulness of an object. The object is not important. Right, the object is not important as the panel that has the spitting reiterated with a jumble of color from other panels, but this ghost-like image of my mother looking out of a window worried from another sequence. Um, and that was for me the tug of war between form and content that uh, is an exciting one. I wouldn't want right. to work with one and not the other in any instance. And I mean, you know, of course I wound up seeing, every time I saw the word art connected uh, oh. to your work, I said, art, you said that art is not the, the, art, the artfulness of the object is the, is the <laughs> point. And I thought, well, you know, and then you're, this kid playing paddle ball is art. So anyway. Um, but. It, Maybe in a way that's a sort of an answer to my first question. Um, it occurred to me when I was looking at that, I mean, as you just said, there's this real tension because you, as is so often the case in your work, um, uh, you've said on several occasions that, that uh, comics is a, is a way of dealing with abstraction, your wonderful homage to Charles Schultz. Um, but there's a great specificity in your work, and uh, uh, part of it, the enormous pull of it is, is the, the um, incredible detail and, and fearlessness of the memory. So to sort of uh, use that, uh, this story, which is a, as I said, funny and kind of heartbreaking story where you realize that your mother can't protect you and you're also not protecting her and you're both sitting there being bullied, um, as a, as, a, as a sort of an illustration of uh, Shklovsky's formalism. Mm -hmm. the, the tension between these two things is, yeah. is wonderful. And, and his insight that, especially that we're 
part of uh, your job as an artist is to complexify and prolong perception and make perception more difficult struck me as a very Jewish uh, <laughs> perception. I thought, well, you know, there's Proust, of course, who does it over seven very, very long books, but mm. Proust was a Jew. I mean, there's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a way of insisting that uh, we stop and, and uh, um, rather than sort of running on to the next thing, uh, uh, tear what we either remember or refuse to remember apart mm -hmm. until we get to the, the yeah. stuff underneath. And that struck me as a... That's why I can't separate it from cartooning, because cartooning asks for that. The cartooning comics asks for that. That thing of, uh, you know, right now we're living through this moment where comics actually are riding high in the culture. They're traveling under a, uh, an Anglo name, graphic novels, but uh, it's still Schwartz, you know? It's a... Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, um, and under its new name, it's being given a kind of attention and respect that it's rarely been given. And I think Which that- Which has a great deal to do with mouse. I mean, it's really- Yeah, that's certainly helped uh, in a way and hurt in other ways, because now it's like, of course it's serious. It's about the Holocaust, which uh, um, isn't, I mean, I've, we've just, we're talking about this before. There's too many things about the Holocaust that aren't at all serious uh, um, in, in a real way. but. In any case, it certainly was a demo that slowed people down and made them pay attention. And what I think is interesting in comics is that they don't move fast at a moment where everything is constantly moving. Talk about Google when, and losing one's mind. Um, there's nobody I know that's not suffering from attention deficit disorder right. at this point, you know? Um, and there's no way to like think about something. It's why books actually have a franchise beyond the iPad because you can't look in the upper right-hand corner and find out what time it is. Right. Um, <laughs> And the thing is that uh, this comics in their own way move and stand still, and it encourages that kind of exploration that you were just describing rather right. eloquently. And, and what you were saying about the, the, I think this strip is downstairs. The, I, I, forgive me, I don't remember the name of the strip, but it's the, the, the two drunks. It's an earlier strip. I think it's from Breakdowns, and there are two drunks in a bar or a drunk guy in a bar, and he's saying, oh, why do I drink? I drink because of my... Oh, that, yeah. Yes. Huh? And there's a fat guy and a mm -hmm. drunk guy, and a sort of happy fat guy and a mm -hmm. miserable drunk. And you can start in either direction uh, in the comic mm -hmm. strip, and sort of it has a narrative sort of A to B to C mm -hmm. event going on, but you get there starting in either direction. So uh, this, this complicated... Uh, assignment is given to you at the beginning of looking at this mm -hmm. strip, which is how do you put all this stuff together and make a narrative? Well, it's the beginning of, of thinking of something that's become interesting to some cartoons I really admire now, like Chris Ware very yeah. specifically, you know? Because it's about breaking that left to right prison. The, uh, you start, because what you learn when you learn to read comics is you start here and then you ignore everything else, go there, then there, then there, and maybe then there, and that's it. Uh, and actually, it's an act of discipline because you you're seeing the whole thing inevitably when you're looking at the page. And here it was like inspired by circuit diagrams. If you go here, then you can go here or here. And I found like about 12 different ways to get through the same anecdote, shorter and longer, and was very interested in the fact that it ended. It only really ended in the middle with a long shot of the world that said, dead end, start again. Uh, and that thing of like having to deal with the way this information has to be sorted to make sense was important to me. And, and gives you this sense of, uh, of the page as, as time itself. Is there, is there less of that in Mouse than there is in... No, it's all just sublimated. Yeah. It's all pushed what do, you, down. what do you mean sublimated in... Uh, well, okay. So I did this book called Breakdowns. Breakdowns was an investigation of these, mostly these formal ideas. Like, uh, unlike you, I'm just not that well read. I'm not that erudite. But I know a lot of comic books. I've read lots of them. And... and Comic books that were done way too quickly to meet deadlines, very often in Batman or something, there'd be arrows telling you where to go, and mm -hmm. it wouldn't be the way you'd want to go. It'd be like, no, 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 don't go there, go here, because otherwise, if you go there, you're going to fall down an elevator shaft, so you've got to get through their passageway. And it was always kind of demented, and it was inspiring for that particular page that we were just talking about. And I just got interested, after I learned that painting wasn't to be avoided as uh, a class that I could never belong to, uh, that went to museums. Uh, um, I then um, 
began to think about how comics were an aspect of modernism, how they fit into it, and indeed now I believe created modernism. Mm -hmm. uh, but that might be another conversation, I'm not sure. Uh, and in any case, was really excited about applying high modernism back into comics, the things I was seeing when I was now finally willing to slow down and look at Cezanne and Picasso. Um, and in the course of all that, I just figured that uh, those were a series of pieces I made after I finally graduated from, from being an apprentice underground comic artist, meaning somebody who was trying to outgrow S. Clay Wilson, who drew the Ruby and the Dykes and the Pervert Pirates and the Checkered Demon, and trying to do things more perverse than him so I could earn my stripes as a badass underground cartoonist, um, began finding traumas closer to my own life and began dealing with those at the same time that I was exploring this formalist aspect of comics. And what I found was after breakdowns came out, I was either going to have to become a gallery artist or learn to tell jokes again, because uh, they, nobody was around to like, have the conversation with. It wasn't something that people were coming to comics for. Uh, so after breakdowns, I figured, OK, if part of my definition of comics is its uh, work ultimately meant for reproduction, which is the way I understood it, then you either have to do something that's worth reproducing for an audience that might come to it somehow, or move into a gallery universe of uh, patrons. I didn't want the latter, so I figured I have to tell a story. It can't be just an arbitrary story as coat hanger that you drape things on. Um, and I had done a three-page strip called Mouse, and I figured, uh, which was the Ur version that's in that show somewhere yeah. in 1972, I knew there's a lot more hanging there that needed to be unpacked. And I figured, okay, that's a narrative worth all of the agonies of making a comic and drawing it panel by panel. But my first goal before I'd focused on that was, you got to do a story that's uh, worth telling somehow. And I just got this idea that I wanted to do a long comic book that needed a bookmark and asked to be reread. Uh, not as snappy as the phrase graphic novel, but it was my own shortest definition of what I was trying to do. Uh, and only after a while did I settle on Mao's as the subject matter, but I was still em embroiled in these issues of what happens on a comics page, and they're all present in Mao's. And in fact, this book I did, Meta Mao's, goes through a fairly extensive part of it, figuring out what the diagramming of a page is and why. Mm -hmm. And one of them very specifically that I did diagram in the book that I did with Hilary Shoot was, um, a uh, page where Vladek is first entering, uh, telling me about entering into Auschwitz, and there's a bit of banter back and forth in which you have to read down because there's balloons overlapping from one panel to the next, and it's just Vladek and Art sort of bickering with each other. And then you have to climb up and read the next large panels down. And it's not the natural way to read, but it feels very natural, not done with arrows, but with other devices. And when you do it the second time, you literally descend into Auschwitz, into the mouth of a large uh, commandant screaming at the Jews who have yeah. just gotten there. Um, so that's using all of that interest in how does an eye move around a page, but really controlling it, not expecting anybody to look at it that way, because at that point, presumably, you're engaged in a narrative. Yeah, and is that wonderful? Um, when I was in the looking at the exhibit earlier today, uh, at, at the display of of Mouse Two behind its glass, I was really relieved when I went and looked at the original uh, the Mouse One drawings, and they're just sort of right there. Mm -hmm. And I was looking very closely, and I thought, you know, if I move in too close, my nose is going to touch the page, and I'm going to leave a <laughs> a little spot or something on, and then I realized that those are reproductions right. of the originals for Mouse. But uh, the panel uh, towards the end, um, when you're looking at the box of photos that your father's found, mm. and the photos start to fall off, begin to fall off the page, and then increasingly mm -hmm. fall off and make this kind of mountain of that goes the pile of bodies uh, elsewhere yeah. in the book. Yeah, um, it's also it's. That moment that precedes it, when he says, "I found a couple of boxes in the garage or something," mm -hmm. and you say that Mama's diaries, mm -hmm. um, and and he says, "No, of course those are." And you know, we've learned, I think, in Mouse One that, they, right. that they're already yeah. destroyed. And I think maybe it was Hillary Shoot, somebody interviewing you, made the very interesting point, and it was really brought home to me looking at the originals in the room the size of the book is the size of a diary. Mm -hmm. And that in a way, Mouse, which is very much your father's story and your story, mm -hmm. is also very much her story. And, it's a, and it's, it's a recovery of her 
destroyed diary, which I found That's enormously right. moving. Wow. It wow. never occurred to me that, that you actually drew the book. That must have been, I mean, I felt terrible back pain by the end, thinking of you sitting and doing those. Well, it's very small, as, yeah. right? And, uh, but that was after trying a lot. Of, like every strip I've done, I tend to like search for a different uh, surface, a different style for it. Uh, and I was trying a number of things. Some of the, I think one or two of the experiments are even in the exhibit somewhere, like trying it in scratch board, looking like woodcuts yeah. or whatever. And then, while I was doing that, without thinking about the style, I was just trying to figure out what would be on a page. And my artiste friends liked me doing that because it was gestural, it was clumsy in some ways and expressive in others. And I realized eventually that that was what it should look like except under control because it wasn't about the expressiveness of my lines for the most part. It was about wanting something that was between handwriting and type. Mm. And for that, the style should be the same size as the printed book, which is not the way comics are usually done. Like even most of my other strips are reduced down to get rid of right. the... Um, vagaries of, of the hand to make it feel crisper. I wanted it to be on a one-to-one -one relationship with the reader. And the problem, in fact, with that scratchboard drawing was it uh, asked for a kind of a, it gave me a kind of spurious authority. I have the craft to make something that looks like a woodcut, shut up and listen. This looks even more primitive than it is. Uh, and it allows it to have a kind of intimacy, and the intimacy was important, and that feeling of a diary was there. And even when doing MetaMouse, I discovered some other aspect of the book that was there, which is my first um, uh, coming up against uh, what had happened to my parents was in the form of, on the one hand, just hearing little stray bits of uh, information and conversation that just scared the shit out of me, and we didn't go there. But in the back room of our house in Queens, there was a bookshelf of the forbidden books, which naturally I, w I made a beeline for whenever my parents went out of the house. It's how I discovered uh, Lady Chatterley's Lover uh, and how I discovered a book about Aleister Crowley who ate shit. Uh, I don't know what my mother was doing with he, these books. He ate shit? Yeah, it was part of his mystical beliefs. Um, really? He was the beast. I never, I, I know who he is, but I didn't know that he ate shit. Yeah. I'm just, that's... that's part of what, there was a word I had to look up called coprophilia. Um, I know what coprophilia is. I just think it's probably as a coprophilia. It's good for his health. I don't know. I'm not a prec I'm not religious. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but in that same section, there were these things that my mother had collected after the war, which were little kind of almost uh, Sami's dot small press, uh, very primitively made first histories, first drafts of history, mm -hmm. people would come back and uh, in either Ukrainian, Yiddish, or Polish would be writing what, was happen what had happened to them and their towns. Uh, and these things were unreadable to me, but they have a few photographs which were the my first exposure to those atrocity photos. Well, who published them? I mean, they were, were like a small press somewhere in Krakow, the ones that she had. Uh, and they were done on, you know, just very primitive printing equipment. Uh, they were like fanzines mm. almost, you know. Uh, and a few of them were drawing, books of drawings. Uh, one of them by a woman who either survived or her drawings survived. Ravensbrook, very delicate, very small watercolors. Some of them are in that MetaMouse. Uh, book. Yeah. Um, and another one which was really weird, it was gag cartoons about Auschwitz by some Ukrainian. Um, oh but the jokes were always like, ha ha, he thought he was going to get a cigarette and instead he got clubbed to death. Uh, you know, like New Yorker cartoons. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, or like the cartoons uh, you submitted. But for this was my years. first visual information about, the, uh, about what the genocide was, what my parents lived through, and it made a very deep impression. I certainly couldn't make any sense of the text. And I didn't think about them that much while I was working on Mouse, but when I looked back to do Meta Mouse, um, I was thinking about the things I had been thinking about, including those books that my mother were on my mother's shelf, and looking at the way Mouse first was appearing in Raw magazine as a small booklet with certain kind of two-color cover designs. They looked like they were a continuation of those books, hmm. the graphic design elements, and that was a kind of startling thing for me. Yeah, do you think that the physical difficulty of producing uh, work on that scale um, contributed at all to the... It, maybe, maybe I'm not... Stronger an artist, glasses so by the end of it, but no... no yeah, I was worried about your eyes. I mean, no, no, really what it was was I just didn't want there to be room for extra detail, so it meant a lot of iterations to get it to be readable, uh, and I wanted, like I said, that kind of intimacy, but I, I wanted it to have a certain aspect where it looked a little crude. It wasn't a refined cartoon illustration. Um, and the problem for me was that as I got toward the end of the book, which is like we're talking about a 13-year 
project. Right. Uh, near the end, I'd gotten so good at drawing small that if the book had been any longer, I would have had to draw smaller than original size and blow it up because you just learn how to navigate these one and a half inch, two inch high areas. Um, but I did need these kind of breakout moments. Like before we started, you mentioned these Bar Bars VN covers that you yeah, haven't that seen before. I was doing them. Uh, there's this, sec this section of large um, things where I had carte blanche to do whenever and whatever I wanted for the German editions of uh, this kind of person who has a kind of place somewhere between Kerouac and uh, Dizzy Gillespie in French culture. Um, and uh, an interesting surrealist. Anyway, I could do whatever I wanted for those books whenever I wanted. And what I did was graphic experimentation where I could like change styles radically, even from cover to cover, let alone from what Mouse was demanding of me, and worked in a very large scale so I could move my arms again. And uh, they have nothing to do with Mouse except the, the, the uh, necessary uh, yo-yoing of moving away from what Mouse was demanding. So when you mentioned somewhere that, that uh, it took 13 years because it's an enormous amount of work and a, a tremendous amount of painstaking research, not because you woke up every morning and thought, oh, God, I don't want to go back to Auschwitz again. I'll do something else, and I'll get to it the day after. Well, that was, but, that was some of that. I mean, is, was there, I mean, was it, it? It wasn't every day for 13 years I drew boxes. Yeah. Uh, no, that would have been much quicker. Uh, it's making false starts, moving in directions that weren't panning out, because it's a, it's a, it's a subject matter that obviously comes with a lot of uh, demands. And one of the demands is don't be stupid. Uh, and even though I once read this book on drawing when I was in uh, an art high school, Nicolaides, The Natural Way to Draw, uh, that was first thought, best thought. It was like born in, from that abstract mm. expressionist uh, Right, the gesture idea. guy, right? The yeah. gesture. Um, and for me, you know, first thought, first thought. Sometimes it's the stupidest thought you could have. Sometimes after a lot of other tries, you find out it's really a great thought. But it's a, for me, it was just uh, layers of work to discover how to tell aspects of the story, learn more, work on more. I was doing other stuff. I was doing things like Garbage Pail Kids. I was doing uh, occasional other comics. Were you still pages. doing Garbage Pail Kids when you for the were first working book. on Mouse? Yeah, mostly towards the first book. In fact, uh, I, but I started working for the Bubblegum Company when I was 18 oh, years old. Very, yeah. yeah. Uh, and um, I, was, I told you, I, when I went down to the exhibit, I sort of hung out by the Garbage Pail Kids to see if I could pick up anyone saying anything you know, funny. Uh, yeah. While they were in, this one woman you know, looked at them for a really long time and said, "Oh, I remember these." And I remember that there was a great deal of controversy about. There's a lot of controversy about it. In fact, that's what made it such a success. A lesson I kept in mind when joining up with the New Yorker a few years later. Uh, the um, the thing was that I'd been working there for a long time. It's second nature. I loved. It was as close as I ever had to having a job. Uh, but. Now, as eight, 1986 was approaching, the first volume was going to come out. Uh, my editor at Pantheon, a very respectable house, uh, and my publisher who just died a few days ago, Andre Schiffman, were horrified mm -hmm. when they realized I had been doing Garbage Pail Kids. Because here they were, a very reputable house and, uh, with a, a well-earned <laughs> reputation. Uh, and the Garbage Pail Kids were all over the news, you know, like they were a real fad. Uh, and people were really upset by them the way that uh, a generation earlier parents were upset by the horror comic books, you know. Um, and uh, Topps Bubblegum, a, a wonderful grindhouse schlock publishing place of a certain kind, the lowest echelon of publishing, which is even how I got to meet them when I was 14 or 15 years old. But without going into that part of the story, what it was was they wanted me and everybody else involved with Garbage Pill Kids and uh, that kind of thing to be anonymous because they were afraid that Fleers would hire us away at a slightly better subsistence rate <laughs> from Tops. They knew who you uh, were. So they wouldn't let us sign any of these things. They didn't want it known. Then I'm over now not in the Bush Terminal section of Brooklyn in Red Hook, but uh, uptown at the Random House uh, digs. And um, my editor and publisher are equally eager for me to keep my connection to Garbage Pill Kids quiet, you know, <laughs> saying, you know, if anybody makes that connection right now, it's all going to be about Garbage Pill Jews, and this book is dead in the water, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and, mm -hmm. Um, but my favorite moment, I think, was when in a, the, one of the earliest iterations of the show that's now really um, consummately uh, installed downstairs. It was uh, hung much more in a much more compressed way at the Pompidou, in a place that wasn't usually used for uh, art, but it was in the bibliotheque 
there. Mm -hmm. And they built some kind of tent-like walls to hold the thing. It was a really impressive thing as well. The way it was hanged, though, was as soon as you walk in, you see that garbage pail kid stuff right away. And looming above and behind it was a giant blow-up of the selection drawing that becomes an end paper. And it's kind of jolting. I'm not jolted because I know I did all that, plus the Playboy cartoons, plus the formalist experiments, plus whatever. But Francoise is going in and says, you know, you're the only person who could get away with this without being lynched. <laughs> really? you know? And yet they feel so connected to me. Like I feel that uh, they're one work in some weird, weird way. It's all. In what way do you think that's. Okay? Well, you I know, have, I, I mean, I think that. that uh, you know, Garbage Pail Kids was obviously a parody of the Cabbage Patch Dolls, who are these kind right. of uh, uh, homely orphans, uh, none of whom would have survived Poland. Um, <laughs> and <laughs> and they, they were all very specifically um, uh, refuse. You know, they were the rejected ones, and you're supposed to nurture the, the, the rejected. Uh, and that aspect of things seems like it has, even though it, it was a shocking tone when, uh, I don't remember whether it was Tom Engelhardt or Andre Schiffrin, probably Tom, who mentioned garbage pail Jews, and, and just please just don't mention this when we're being uh, asked about comics as a possible serious medium, okay? Uh, but both garbage pail kids and Mao's would not have been possible without mad comics. Uh, they grew out of different aspects of the same artist's inspiration, Harvey Kurtzman. Kurtzman, the guy who invented the sense, mad and the sensibility that mad brought into the world, also was uh, invented mad because he couldn't um, make enough money doing the comic books that he's really devoted himself to, which were called, one was called Frontline Combat, one was called Two-Fisted Tales. They were war comics mm -hmm. at a time where the genre comics were uh, more popular than the superhero genre comics. And they were done during the Korean War. And his comics were nothing like what you'd associate with war comics uh, when you were growing up, which would be like Sergeant Rock and the Easy Company, like uh, you know this kind of grand John Wayne scale things. These were all. I never, I never read. I read. You never read any of that. Well, right? no, I read superhero. Okay. Uh, because of the guys in the underwear and stuff, it was like the. But didn't they were hot? So. <laughs> but they still had a couple of uh, what was it? it was not Sergeant. Maybe it was, no, Sergeant Rock was DC. I don't remember the EC, uh, the um, Marvel Comics guy. But they had their kind of, they looked like they were, they were drawn by the same people who did the superheroes. They were coming out uh, at least through the 70s into the 80s, and they were just like war is fantasy. Uh, his war stories were incredibly well researched. Mm. They had a very tight, he invented a grammar for comics that's very useful. Because uh, comics, unlike film, didn't have a... D.W. Griffith, it was incremental, and he really brought a lot to how rigorous a comics page could be. Um, and his stories, very well researched, were not about like these gung-ho uh, uh, historically researched uh, tales instead. They were sober stories about young kids likely to get blown up. Mm. Uh, and they were, if not anti-war, at least humanist. And they were very sober, serious work. Now one can look back at them and say, what was all the fuss in the 50s? There were these amazing, uh, serious, important works being made in this lowly medium. Uh, so for me, it's the same kind of thing that just has to do with my own sense of what my heritage is. Well, and, and also, uh, I mean, I remember when the Garbage Pail Kids first uh, attracted media attention, there was this debate, as there always is, you know, um, that, that people like you are destroying the minds of young people, uh, sort of skipping over the fact that young people are devouring this stuff by the bushelful and, and uh, not wanting to talk about the disturbing fact or not so disturbing fact that kids really love this stuff. So it's not something that you've, uh, not new information that you're giving them, but information that's already there. No, I wasn't perverting them. I was just remembering having been perverted and wanting to make right. sure I could hang out with other perverts even if they were only seven years old. Exactly. Um, uh, but it wasn't about that so much. It was really uh, like, I think parents get really upset when their kids are into something because they can't control it. And comics really were the first mass medium directed at children. Uh, yeah. And uh, it made comics very threatening. It made these things that they could buy with their lunch money very threatening, unless they were such uh, upstanding kids as to buy baseball cards that I was forced as karmic uh, uh, vengeance on me to design, <laughs> even though I didn't know one player from another. Uh, but nevertheless, the Bubblegum Company was pre creating things for kids directly. Oddly, or maybe not so oddly, as soon as I had my own kids, 
I stopped working for the bubblegum company and started working on children's books, <laughs> you know, the, the reputable side of the street. I mean, I mean I, what I was going to say is I think that there's an, maybe something, some connection between uh, work like Mouse and work like the Garbage Pail Kids in uh, the uh, willing to, willingness to reveal um, uh, uh, sort of not easily assimilable truths about human beings, including the appetites and, and awareness of violence and, I mean, uh, poverty yeah. and danger and rejection, parental and... There's, that, and there's also just like, I think I just was born with a screw loose in the sense that I don't know <laughs> what you're not supposed to do. Right. Uh, so I ended up stumbling into it over and over again this as is a the natural place where you and problem. Maurice uh, Sendak had uh, uh, a <laughs> yeah. wonderful meeting ground because right. this is also constantly a thing with Maurice is mm -hmm. you're, you're ruining children by showing them something that they don't want. It's real, and then, as uh, if they weren't interested in real. real. There's a, in in uh, Jay Hoberman's uh, wonderful essay introducing the catalog mm -hmm. for the show, there's a footnote that uh, ha has a point that uh, I found very moving. Um, he says that, that uh, arguably or inarguably, the most famous work of literature about the Holocaust is a teenage girl's diary, mm -hmm. the diary of Anne Frank. And then he, I don't remember if he makes the connection directly to Mouse, but uh, he calls uh, the Anne Frank's uh, diary a subliterary form. It's what we would now call oh. YAL, young adult <laughs> literature. And, and I think, uh, arguably, the second most famous or the other most famous work about the Holocaust, Mouse, is a comic book. And there's something interesting, I think, in the fact that, that, uh, that these two forms, I mean, a teenage girl who really is a teenage girl, I mean, she's very, very smart and a wonderful writer, but she has a, a kid's eye view of this thing, that, that there's... Uh, that these forms that one thinks of as being connected to um, childhood or early adolescence um, become the, uh, huh. a, a major means of, of thinking about this, uh, hmm. you know, what, well, uh, a great I'm having one of my, I need my century. Google moments. Who's the guy who said no poetry after Auschwitz? Uh, I don't know. Thank you. Uh, I also was thinking about him because in his uh, book, Minimum Moralia, he says that when he first started seeing Nazis on the street, before he fled Germany, his first memory was of bullies in the mm -hmm. gymnasium where he was a student as a young kid, and he felt ashamed of himself that he was minimizing the threat that fascism posed by going back in memory to being picked on. Mm -hmm. And then he said, but of course, then I realized that those kids who picked on me in the gymnasium turned into right. brown shirts and black shirts. Yeah, like, see, you saw superheroes and saw hot dudes in underwear, and I just saw them as the people who beat me up, so I had to stay with the Donald Duck comics a lot longer. Yeah, well, um, the advantage of being gay is that I got to see But I was bringing up the Adorno thing as, like, uh, he, even re he never quite said that, and he recanted it anyway, uh, that line about poetry after Auschwitz. But when I was working on Mouse, I went, well, he didn't say anything about comic books. I'm not a poet. <laughs> so you're, you're, you don't you're, have a problem with this, you know? <laughs> I mean, it's a, the, the issue of, of what children can assimilate and what children can understand and, and uh, the protection of children from historical trauma is a, a latent and overt theme in a great deal of what, of what you've done. Mm -hmm. It's a, and a, a very moving um, part of your overall body of work. It's a... Yeah, again, like, you know, I'm not coming from this uh, tradition that would, like, have me then talk about, ah, oh, yes, Cortez's novel, Faithless, which actually is really good. Did you ever, do you know this one? I the one that won the Nobel Prize. He was a Hungarian writer. Cortez, uh, yeah. Yeah, um, which really is an interesting, like, uh, young adolescent's eye view of what he's living through, very knowing, but in a way it's like if Hol Holden Caulfield had been in Auschwitz, uh, this might be the book that would come out of that. Uh, so it's not like that tradition. For me, it was the horror comics of the 1950s that mm -hmm. uh, I got excited by finding a pile on a garbage dump and then getting my father to get me more. Uh, Where do you think that stuff came from? I, I don't know those comics very well, but I've read your mm -hmm. invocations of them and panels that have been reproduced in essays. By, what was that expressing? What, all that? Well, that's, what, that's exactly the point I was trying to make. Is, Again, you're talking about comics and Jews here somehow. Um, like, comic well, books are a very Jewish, Jewish industry. Museum, so yeah, and the comic books were a very Jewish medium. Not comic strips, but comic books were the low-rent 
district, uh, people who might have aspired to be writers or artists but would be in a no Jews allowed zone in the 1930s and 40s, uh, found that they could pick up a buck here and there working in this schmata trade of comic books that were just developing. Uh, so Kurtzman, who I was mentioning, was a comic book artist working for a publishing house that had William Gaines and Al Feldstein doing these more popular comics, the ones that really got parents upset, the Tales from the Crypt, the mm -hmm. Vault of Horror, and where other people were seeing these as uh, an absolute uh, perversion of, of childhood and children, uh, including this guy, Dr. Frederick Wortham, a German Jew who was responsible for demolishing the particular house of cards of comics. Uh, but I saw those comics really as a secular Jewish response to Auschwitz in the, in the post-war years. They're all about the dead coming back to life and taking revenge, about horror in a uh, uh, contemporary situation. Like one famous cover that I've used in some slide talks is a severed arm hanging onto a subway so strap, yes, <laughs> you know? And in a way, it's this repressed, uh, the return of the repressed. In the 1950s, one just, it just wasn't a topic of conversation. Uh, and there were these horror comics, and they, they reeked, they smelled of what had just happened uh, 10 years before. I love the story of how you found your first batch of those comics. Can you tell the audience with your father? Oh, well, yes. What happened was um, my father, who's a close man with a buck, uh, uh, wasn't really happy uh, about me wasting my allowance money on comic books. Ten cents. Uh... Ten cents. But, I, you know, I'd get like 25, and that would allow me to get two comics and a candy bar for my allowance. Um, and then he said, 10 cents each? That's, he just thought it was way too much for, but he didn't follow, you know, he didn't read uh, much about uh, the comic books are ruining our children part of the newspaper. It was not on his frequency at all. Uh, so he said he could get comics cheaper near where he worked in the Diamond Dealers uh, District around 47th Street. And it took him a while, but eventually just brought me a big pile of comics. Um, and at first I was really uh, unhappy because they were coverless, beaten up old comic books. And then when I opened one, it scared the shit out of me. It was one of these things I'm just telling you about now, these horror comics. And they were amazing because they got such a strong jolt out of me. Uh, so um, two things happened. One was I began to explain to him which comics to bring home. Like, not, no more of the ones with people kissing on the cover. Uh, <laughs> And then, on the other hand, I found out about this comics uh, code uh, that had actually denatured, denurtured the comics that I would be buying on the corner newsstand. Um, and uh, I found out that there was this guy, Frederick Wortham. So I went to the library, found this book uh, called Seduction of the Innocent, which is the one that uh, brought the comics empire tumbling down. And in the back, there was a list of the dangerous comic books. So I was able to give my father titles to ask. <laughs> And in the strip uh, the, where you tell this story, uh, these, these comic strips have been outlawed because Wortham decides that they're turning America, this is the cause of juvenile delinquency. Mm -hmm. And so Art, as a, as a sort of very presentable little boy, uh, uh, opens these comics that his father's brought and, and, and is fascinated. And then in the next panel, you show up and you're dressed head to toe in black leather, and your hair is in a big Elvis sort of Pompadour, like yeah. Pompadour's lick, oh, and you, you, you say, hey, Pops, get me some more of those right. books. Here's a quarter for next week's <laughs> batch, Pops. And you flip them a quarter, and then in the kind of detail that I just think is so extraordinary, and you're, your father is sitting there looking at the quarter, and it's actually bent, that you're, you're so tough that when you flip it at him, an end is a little bit uh, turned down. There's a, in, in The Shadow of No Towers, which is a work that I think I reread and reread, I think it's just extraordinary. There's a moment of uh, Bush and Cheney flying on an eagle, and the eagle is weep with the Uncle Sam hat, and it's weeping and saying, why do they all hate us so much? And Cheney is uh, cutting the eagle's throat with a box cutter. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's I mean, this is why you get into trouble so much, but it's kind of an amazing jumble of things because it's not that just this sort of patriotic, patriotic rapacious bird. Uh -huh. uh, it's also, in a way, kind of the American people not getting the point, but being, you know, well, yeah, killed uh, by like a, these the real terrorists. Us in, yeah, this is well, like by a terrorist. Up for war crimes. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, but I don't, you know, like I keep not getting with the program in a way that I'm, I don't mind that it's that way. But back when there was that Republican convention for the re-election of uh, 
of uh, Bush and Cheney, I'd gotten permission or from the New election York. of Bush and Cheney. Uh, yeah. They weren't elected the uh, first time. Right. But anyway. Thank you. I stand happily corrected about a true thing. Uh, but anyway, I had a pass to get into Madison Square Garden uh, to cover this for the New Yorker in comics format. Uh, and I went, I, I wasn't, I didn't really know my way around a uh, Republican convention, was kind of fascinated by it, but each day I would get more and more horrified, you know, like one moment was the Ar Arnold Schwarzenegger day where he was giving his speech and all of these Republicans are going, USA, 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 <laughs> and that got me to flee from, uh, past the police barricades <laughs> back to where the protesters were eight blocks away so I could join them. Um, and then the next night was a night where Cheney was there and I'd never seen him except as an electronic uh, you know, escapee from some kind of horrible Star Wars uh, cantina scene. <laughs> uh, and um, he's there and like, I'd never seen anything like this before. He radiates evil. Uh, he is there like a sleepy giant frog, like not even interested in his own troops. He's there to rally them somehow, but he's barely awake and he has, he, there's a kind of disinterest and contempt for this entire kind of whipped up fervor. Um, and it really scared the hell out of me. So um, I had to skip the next day because it was, oh, my poor nerves. Fortunately, when uh, I was telling a cartoonist friend about this, he said, that's really funny because I was describing him as reptilian. He said, you really should see the, the Godzilla remake. Um, which is all about uh, reptiles being born and taking over Madison Square Garden and then the world. Um, and it became the punchline for that piece for the New Yorker, actually. And then when I came back the day after, uh, I was finding uh, two things were interesting. One was that uh, 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 Roger Moore was there. Uh, and I thought, oh, a friendly face. And all of a sudden, he's surrounded by security people trying to drag him out of the building, roughing him up. And I'm way, you know, <laughs> happy to see him. Like, I didn't get that this was a problem. Um, eventually, they, they actually let, let him in, but kept a cordon around him at all times. And this was the night that uh, Bush was speaking. And something that I'd been told about by, um, was it Philip Gorovich? Yeah, who's guruing me through this a bit, um, was saying, you'll see, he actually has a lot of charisma. Uh, which didn't work for me exactly, but I saw that in that audience he really did, and he actually could read a cue card without stumbling. I mean, it was a, a revelation. I, I've, I always felt Mr. in the same way with Reagan, uh, this sort of like people think, but he's so charming, he's so delightful, he has so much charisma, and I just, there's something, I didn't get that particular uh, receptor. I don't, <laughs> it, isn't, it isn't working for me. I find him completely no, I, uh, alarming. I think one of the moments where I keep, you know, <laughs> trying to be optimistic and then losing all faith was when he died and um, NPR spent an entire day celebrating Reagan, I just felt I had no place to go anymore. Uh, it's, uh, um, well. Yeah, I, 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 I'm, I'm with you, baby. I, I really, it's just, and then the same thing with Thatcher, with the Baroness Thatcher, except you could go on YouTube and watch Glenda Jackson deliver that. Uh -huh. Astonishing, the thing that you don't get to do in the United States, but in, did you see her? After Thatcher died and there was all this sort of, you know, like, dribble about what a wonderful person she was, what a feminist she was, et cetera. Um, uh, Glenda Jackson got up in, in Parliament and delivered this, it's still on YouTube, this Jeremiah about her. It's just reminds you that she was one of, that she is one of the great actors of all time and it was, she just <laughs> raging about, you know, that, what, a, what a monstrous person. You know? <laughs> The Baroness Thatcher, actually. Was. I mean, the only thing I really remember about the Thatcher period was the Monty Python sketch of her going into a men's urinal and standing up and pissing with all of the other ministers. <laughs> <laughs> I guess that's feminist, so I don't know. So um, I'm just going to go ahead. I've like shot way, I'm sorry. I'm really bad with time. So this is, we're okay? Oh. So should we open it up to the, to the audience? So I'm just going to say, since this is my third time doing a Q&A at the Jewish Museum, uh, ask a question, please don't make a speech. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so would anybody like to? Because I said that thing about speeches, so now nobody wants to. <laughs> was working. 
working for the New Yorker, and are you still doing it? They really were very controversial. Well, I'm, yeah, I was, I'm proud of having like broken the DNA of the New Yorker and brought it down to Topps bubblegum level, but uh, uh, I'm, I haven't done any for quite a few years now, uh, but I loved doing it at first because uh, it, it was a, a place to try to reinvent myself after, after uh, oh, he's the guy who did Mouse and got a Pulitzer Prize for it. I just didn't want that to be the uh, obligatory uh, parenthesis after my name. Uh, and for a while, that was fun to be doing this stuff with, with uh, um, Tina Brown reinventing the magazine and allowing things that couldn't have happened there easily before. Uh, and on the other hand, it was exhausting working uh, for The New Yorker, trying to find where my sensibility in The New Yorkers might overlap. Uh, and eventually, um, I was seeing articles about me as The New Yorker's Art Spiegelman. And then I got a little less interested in doing it regularly. Uh, and eventually, the hard part was almost every time I'd come up with a cover that uh, um, I was really interested in making, I'd have to defend it before it was finished. Uh, and the very first one, that one of the Hasid uh, and uh, black woman kissing in the wake of the Crown Heights riots, was the only time The New Yorker ever had a piece inside the magazine explaining the cover. Uh, <laughs> because there's a lot of tension about running such a thing. Um, and then I found that there was the process of drawing and then the process of being a defense attorney of why this image makes sense. Uh, and um, that became difficult. And eventually what became difficult was uh, something that's nobody's fault except mine, which is um, in order to do work for a magazine, and in fact I functioned as an editor many times, one submits work. And I'm not good at submitting. Uh, and the idea of like ha having the work hang in judgment uh, for somebody else to allow it in or out rather than me, where uh, that's where the responsibility should lie, I just could never come to terms with it. So it's easier for me to work with enablers rather than with editors. Um, <laughs> and, um, and, and it has to do ultimately with, I had covers that were accepted by The New Yorker that I then rejected. Uh, and did another cover that got accepted instead. I've had that a few times. And uh, I had covers where um, things were accepted and then I had second thoughts about it and just let myself get talked into it and regretted it after. Uh, so that whole process wasn't the most congenial, even though it's a mighty and important platform because it does allow, at this point, Francoise, my wife, remains there every week and is in charge of bringing these beautiful and incendiary and funny and poetic covers in. And I'm glad, like I said, to have been part of the DNA of making it happen. I don't say that I'd never do a cover again. It's just I don't think about it as, I don't have a part of my brain that's going, what could be a New Yorker cover this week? It's not an important uh, uh, zone for me right now, although I'm glad to see what is happening. And what happens there becomes now in the world of the internet, because most of the ones I did would get thousands of outraged letters than, rather than 50 million outraged tweets and comments on a, an electronic screen, um, is like they act as genuine focusing points and catalysts for conversation. So it's a, a really important area where comics can still function and cartooning can still function. Hi. So I was hoping uh, the two of you might talk about theater and the theater pieces that you've done, Mark, uh, Drawn to Death and the new one that's downstairs, and that's a medium you both have in common. Oh, we approach it so differently, and he understands it. I just like to go where I'm going to be either an idiot or an idiot savant and see which way it turns up. Um, and. I mean, you're a, a man. Well, and, and Art, I should say, is uh, uh, going to be performing at uh, BAM on uh, Brooklyn Academy of Music on January 18th. Uh, he's doing a, um, a, as I understand it, a kind of musical. I don't think it's a complicated thing. It's a, a cross between a slide talk lecture, academic lecture with stand up comedy aspects, all surrounding a concert of showing a certain kind of work that. Uh, is an important part of the history of my medium, but they're beautiful and wonderful works in their own right with a collaborator who's a composer for silent film scores as well as a jazz musician. So there'll be six musicians and me weaving in and out of each other. I did it at the Sydney Opera House. It worked really great. I'm, I was really excited that it could be part of my exhibit, except I couldn't like hang these six 
musicians hammer their coats into the wall and then come in and show slides next to them. So I was just lucky that this ephemeral event could take place while the show is up here. Um, one of the things about theater that's maddening to me, and I, if I was interviewing you, I'd want to ask about movies and theater, uh, is that it disappears while it's happening. Like the really great thing about comics, which is supposed to be ephemeral, but newsprint holds up surprisingly well, it turns right. out, uh, is the few times I've had anything to do with trying to, at some point I was involved in something called Drawn to Death, a three panel opera about the rise and fall of comic books with the same composer. And we never got out of workshops. We did it that way for mm. a long time. Uh, but that thing made me realize just how crazily ephemeral it is. Like it's, the, the minute it's over, it's over, and you'll never have exactly that lighting moment gesture. Uh, and film is preserving something like as if it was in a time capsule forever. And um, as long as we're asking questions, I would ask you, like, uh, are there advantages to both, or do you do just, one, just do one for the money? <laughs> <laughs> and, and health insurance, don't, don't forget. <laughs> health insurance is a very nice thing. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, I. I uh, this is evening is about you, so I don't want to. Uh, but I, I I love the um, uh, ephemerality and the evanescence, uh, the continual evanescence of theater, and the fact that that one night to the next uh, a show is completely changed by the interaction between the actor and the audience, and and uh, and that when it's gone, it's really gone. Except plays last like comic books, but. Uh, there's a, but they're always there's, being drawn and inked by somebody else every time it comes out again, right? Yeah, and that is also, I mean, That's the, the, you, the yeah. fact that it's not fixed and that it is a fixed, I mean, I, I said this in the book that I wrote about Maurice, that uh, one thing that I've always felt in uh, common with Maurice as, a, as an illustrator, and one of the reasons I've always really loved uh, comics as a form, is that it, it has that amphibious quality. It's neither, you quote the Rudolph Top. Top, topper, topper. Yeah. That that, as an artist, uh, one maybe might just say, middling and the writing. If, uh, you may, but then you might be amused by his writing. If you're not that interested in the writing, you might admit that he has a bit of a flair for drawing. For drawing, like right? That, that you're know, neither this existing in two zones. Kind fish, kind flesh, yeah. uh, um, and that's true of playwriting also. I mean, mm -hmm. the greatest writer that ever lived was a playwright. So we have this kind of automatic pedigree from Shakespeare, but uh, it's not exactly. Literature, it's something, it's entertainment, and it's a score for a kinetic event. And I love the, I love the, the sort of peculiarity of it um, and, and the fact that it doesn't ever settle entirely. Mm -hmm. uh, the, you know, again, reading your uh, work over in preparation for tonight, the, the, the whole question of the primacy of word, I mean, this is a big debate in opera as well, the primacy of word or image, mm -hmm. um, and how in, in really, uh, great examples of, I don't, what do I call it, comic? It's such a weird word, but uh, of whatever it is you do, uh, that, that they're inseparable. I love that you say that, that you look for a style in mouse that was somewhere between typography and hand, I mean, that, mm -hmm. that it was a, it, it's a form of writing that's drawing, and it's a form of drawing that's mm -hmm. writing, and I think, so. Yeah. But for me, the ephemerality is both interesting and scary as hell, because it's hard to say, I just drew a stupid joke for Playboy, and that's going to live forever. <laughs> you yes. know, uh, but in a way, it, it's there to be rediscovered. The problem with the place where you live the most fully, I think, is that uh, it's so gone when it's gone that unless you find that you're talking to an audience that's actually where you can live comfortably, there's no chance for that audience to find you because you're closed on Saturday night. You know? yeah. uh, and the advantage to do it, like, I, I keep combing back over the history of my medium and go these things that are like, when they first came out, they were like dog whistles. They weren't like popular comics, but they were the best that was being done at that time. And they were great, and they can be rediscovered and, and, and uh, genuinely taken, their measure can be taken now that the zeitgeist allows for that sort of thing to happen. Um, and so the, the weird permanence was really interesting to me. Although, when you were talking about In the Shadow of No Towers before, um, I really thought, A, we were going to die on September 11th, and then I lived in September 11th for about two years, like just, oh, my poor nerves. So I lost all interest in posterity. I was now willing to do cartoons that veered toward politics, because I thought nothing has a shorter shelf life than a political cartoon. They're just used in the margins of textbooks to explain the Teapot Dome scandal or something. <laughs> um, and 
Uh, I, here, I, there was no sense of a real long-lasting future, which is probably more realistic than the bubble I often have deluded myself into living in. Oh, it, in a thousand years, somebody could read something. You know, um, More likely, we'll all be off the planet within uh, our right. grandchildren's lifetimes if we're not careful. But oh, sorry to put you off on that particular part of my brain. Um, <laughs> bringing it back in over here, I was really interested in doing stuff for newspapers and magazines as, uh, as pages, because I figured, OK, a book, that's a ridiculous project. But I might live long enough to see another page come out. And that would have uh, a certain kind of life that I know how to inhabit. Uh, Make working for a printed page. And the things I was taking sustenance in, I think I say in the introduction to that book, was not uh, Auden, who was being read on every radio show and on every gathering yeah, of more than eight yeah. people. Um, yeah, uh, but the old Sunday comics that were made right. to disappear the next day because that ephemerality had a kind of uh, real poetry for me. Well, and it's so moving in, 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 in the shadow that, that you say that these, these the yellow kid and the the towers are shown as the cats and jammer twins mm -hmm. with little mm -hmm. uh, towers coming out of their head on fire, and they're running around in the street mm -hmm. saying, "You know, put out our." You know, and and the I just found that I, I the first time I read it, I was mystified by it, but I was so <laughs> moved by it. I thought, oh, "This uh -huh. is exi this is the, the, these things." These old memories, kind of yeah, it was a fever dream the, for me because after September 11th, the present sucked, uh, and uh, I went really. Taking, I couldn't listen to music. It was too beautiful. It, it was, uh, and comics were just the right zone for me. And I was like taking a lot of pleasure in how they weren't made to last. The people making them expected them to disappear the next day. And the fact that you could eavesdrop on their day in 1908 was really an impressive thing. Well, and the, and the story of the in the shadow thought, is yes. looking for your daughter. I mean, is right. the two of you wandering mm -hmm. through Lower Manhattan, trying mm -hmm. well, in that school, mm -hmm. trying to find Nadia, mm -hmm. and so. There's, there's also a connection with those forms and this. this well, I got connected to the fact that the co Sunday comics were born uh, right where J and R is now. Yeah. You know, so as far as I'm concerned, that was ground zero, and all the old comics came up out of it. I was really moved at, in the exhibit downstairs, uh, uh, and then we should uh, oh, take yeah. a couple more questions. <laughs> but I was moved to see that, that it about was published oh. by uh, the Forward. Uh, uh -huh. Especially in the context of the Jewish Museum, I thought, well, how, you know, good for us. Uh, uh -huh. Of course, they would have the guts to publish something that everybody else is running away from in terror. Mm -hmm. One of my favorite panels is you show the towers falling behind an Arnold Schwarzenegger billboard of some movie you oh, know, yeah. about his. Oh. And you say, oddly, people said that, ter that irony died on this day, and there's the most ironic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was some movie about uh, a fireman who fights mm -hmm. terrorism or yes. something. That, so, well, um, can can somebody can you how Alan, what do you okay. Uh, the question was, what, what, uh, I'm going to let Art answer that, but what is the, the, because uh, I'm sure that if the two of us tried to answer it, we'd be here till tomorrow night. But, uh, well, how about, what do you think, the, what's outraging you at the moment? You can't get as outraged at Obama as he deserves, right? Why, why? why should anybody be, well, I still am pissed off that, um, I, I genuinely am, because I'm so grateful he's president. Uh, and yet the whole thing seems so wrongheaded to me that uh, like all of this fight about Obamacare is because he gave away the store before he tried to put his program into place. This should have always been, since he was doing the impossible anyway, nobody was going to support this. Why didn't he go after a single payer system? For example, uh, that's the only thing that makes sense. All the trouble he's having now is trying to do something that's too complex to accommodate uh, the crazy, rapacious private enterprise of insurance companies. When he first started doing this thing, he gave the drug companies a bomb, saying, no, no, we won't be able to bring in any generic drugs from uh, Canada. All of that stuff was uh, stuff I would have expected from a very, very, very moderate Republican, no Lincoln. Um, and that really? bothers me, even though I'm, I, I have to say simultaneously I'm really grateful for him. Uh, the alternative is unthinkable. Uh, uh, within that, I want more. And so the, I would say the other, so let me segue from that into the issue that I, I probably have 
uh, most firmly in mind at this point is what Occupy Wall Street brought to the fore. You know, uh, it made it at least part of the conversation. I, I found Occupy Wall Street an incredibly nostalgic and poetic moment in my life. I, lo I loved uh, going down to Zuccotti Park. Um, but, that, but at least uh, for a, media, uh, for a, a uh, movement that didn't want to have leaders and didn't want to have a program, they brought about this really central point and made it something that you have to pay attention to, which is the rapacious uh, differences in, in, in wealth. Income disparity in wealth. Yeah. Um, and it has so many ramifications, including, uh, I mean, it lets you also be outraged about our prison uh, system. It lets you be outraged about people being homeless at the, uh, with the stagnation for kids coming out into the world with no place to go but find a way to pay off college debt. All of, on every level, this is rippling all around, and it's a very dangerous situation. And it's one that hasn't been de dealt with well. And if I'm going to go back to Obama to just finish my moment of sputtering, uh, it would have to do with the fact that um, he didn't bail out the mortgagees, he bailed out the banks. And I find that painful. Uh, and it's why I felt like uh, when we had that day of uh, Ronald Reagan celebration after he died, all Reagan all the time for 24 hours, on fucking NPR, um, <laughs> like that I feel a bit homeless with that kind of rage because I also, I think I would really uh, feel very honored to ever be in the presence of the president as you were. I'm grateful for him in many ways. I find him very charming, but I don't feel it's enough, and I don't mm. know where to go to find enough anymore. We'll have, we'll have to have a, we'll have our own little. I, I, I don't disagree with anything you're saying, except I completely disagree with. The, oh. I mean, uh, <laughs> but I'm not. We really don't have time. I don't want to turn this into. In, go, into go. I'm sure everybody wants to know. No, I mean, I feel that I don't feel I don't believe for a minute that he could have gotten. Uh, if you go back to the fight over the Affordable Care Act in Congress, it would not have passed with a single payer system being an absolute. Uh, and it passed because he was willing to let go of that and let go of other things. Uh, and and the bailout uh, worked. I mean, it, it was very painful. But uh, I spent seven years looking at the many, many painful decisions that Abraham Lincoln had to make in order to keep the border states part of the Union so that we would eventually, by the end of, uh, of the war, It didn't work uh, except for people the, who are like now moving into Manhattan and being moved into further neighborhoods. Well, it, it worked in the sense, it worked in the sense that we it. didn't, unlike Britain and a number of European economies, we didn't go into a double dip recession. I mean, it worked in, as, a, as an economic stimulus, which was the point. And it also kept Wall Street and the business community from completely uh, um, uh, uh, doing its level best to destroy the administration's ability to function in all sorts of ways because given the political economy that we live in, I feel that this guy is building a power base, uh, not just for his second term, but a power base for um, uh, a, a, a turning back towards a progressive form of American democracy. And it's going to take years. And I think that he's made a lot of decisions that I'm sure were as painful for him as they were for us to watch. Some of them may be right, some of them may be wrong. But I think that he's done an absolutely astonishing job. I don't believe that what I would want could happen. But I believe it was the fight that needed to happen. Because as I'm, I'm grateful for this ungepotched thing that's come into existence. You know, but, uh, but I think the odds against this thing squeaking through while giving away such large chunks of it so it, could it can barely stand uh, means that the battle for a genuinely equitable healthcare system like I just saw functioning in Australia and France uh, and Canada uh, was a fight that was almost this one was almost as unwinnable as that one. He should have gone for broke while, while he was still riding but, high. And, and, but not, and then not win. I mean, the Clintons well, did that. Well, we, we, but Clinton didn't did come it. in with all this kind of uh, bankroll, uh, this kind of uh, uh, goodwill. Uh, that but, the, but the goodwill didn't him. translate into congressional votes. I mean, go back and look at what I he think was you could have organized okay. for that. He's a very good organizer. <laughs> He was a very good organizer. He was able to win by organizing on a grassroots level for that first campaign. Uh, for presidency, that he could have gone back to and made his case Right, but the for problem that. that we're looking at now is that we're going to probably, you know, Ken Ahura, Ken Ahura, poo, 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 we're probably going to have Democratic <laughs> presidents for the next little while we're because have, on have the what? Democrats, because, which is like great news, but as Madison warned us, 
on a national level, we're going to get like really good people, uh, especially now with the demographic shift, we're probably going to get progressive, intelligent people in the White House, no more of what we had before Obama, which everybody seems to have forgotten how terrible that was. But anyway, uh, but we're going to, uh, on on, especially in the House of Representatives and in the state houses and state legislatures, we're going to see, because of gerrymandering and so yeah, on, this has and, to be undone. and the, the unequal distribution of population in this country, uh, a real sort of Tea Party level madness, and no, Obama can't organize his way around that. These people are are insane. So uh, you know, I think that what he's managed to do, I mean, it's like with the book, letting. Okay, I'm I'm sorry. Well, for me, it's um, sort of like <laughs> you see it as half full. I see it as quarter full. And I wanted to ask you about that amazing thing that your shrink said in Mouse Two, and you talk about it in Meta Mouse. Maybe it's not in Mouse 2, but it's in MetaMouse. You say, he talks about being uh, a nihilist. Mm. And then you say what an incredibly decent person he is. And he says that he decided to act ethically every day as the most nihilistic thing he, a person could do. That's right. Which I thought was That's a stunning really, thing. I think it was profound. Yeah. And it was true. It wasn't like said to also be clever. Also very Jewish, I think, in a way. I mean, there's a, there's a, there's a uh, you know, the, the idea that, that, that in Judaism you have to grapple with this sort of... Uh, um, deep unknowability mm -hmm. um, that surrounds the Almighty, mm -hmm. and and still act ethically with that. You know, it's the Book of Job. I mean, I, I just thought that was a really stunning thing. But it was one we would. Uh, this is what would happen. Like I had a shrink who I had to beg to take more money because I was feeling guilty. Uh, <laughs> uh, it's just charging me welfare rates. But he would see me at 10 p.m. Uh, and that was a better hour for me to go see him. And then at a certain point, he would doze off, and I'd just wake him up for the interesting parts. <laughs> he was incredibly useful. And then we'd finish sometimes at midnight, and then I'd walk with him. What he would do is he'd gather. He, the house had cats running around it. Um, and I think there's a point in Mao's where I'm saying, is it OK to say that he had cats? Right, that's right. I screw up my metaphor yet again. Um, uh, and then what he would do at the end of his uh, evening was he would gather food scraps and bring them out to Central Park and feed the strays. And it was at the elevator dragging these things out and realizing that he was spending his time taking care of stray cats and at the height of the AIDS epidemic being woken up at 3 in the morning by people dying and dealing with them and dealing with the cats all as extensions of uh, his life in Auschwitz, what he, what he was experiencing there, the people that nobody would look at, the, the well, creatures that, that nobody would That thing that you quote him saying about the people dying of AIDS, that there's this this small group of people dying horribly, and the world is racing just around, around it, it. And exactly. that really reminded him of the Holocaust yeah. when he was a survivor. Yeah. So in the course of that, we're going downstairs, and I said, why do you bother doing this? And that's when he came out with this uh, stunning sentence that had to do with, well, you know, I'm a nihilist. And eventually, I realized that the most nihilistic one thing one can do is behave ethically. Which is something to think Maybe about. Maybe that's a good place for us to stop? or. Yeah. yeah. That was a real conversation. Thank you.